Saskia Jones and Jack Merritt were graduates from Cambridge University. Today, the city grieved for two of their own, the senselessness of what had happened still raw. Two people who believed passionately in the idea of rehabilitation, two people who wanted to make a better life for reform defenders. These labels, what they put in order, like terrorist, this, that, they will know I ain't no terrorist. Usman Khan had adopted an extremist idea of what it meant to be a true Muslim as a teenager. He was sentenced at the age of 19 for terrorist offences. He'd been in de-radicalisation programmes in both prison and after release. So what made him kill? Was Khan simply a good liar able to dupe the authorities? And is the UK's de-radicalisation programme fit for purpose? It's still unclear what rehabilitation programme Khan was on in prison. His lawyer told me, though, that he believed the interventions in prison were lacking. The de-radicalisation programme for Usman and I stand for other, understand for other offenders is a process of psychological assessment. It considers the mental thinking, thought process and health of the individual, but it doesn't address the underlying extremist ideology. Those concerns were shared by others who work in the prison system. I spoke to Manwar Ali, a former extremist, now imam, who works on de-radicalisation programmes in prison. My observation is that we have to be a bit more robust in terms of how we tackle Islamism, that uh, political programme which uses religion, Islam in this case, to advocate an objective which is to establish an Islamic state or the caliphate in some form. And I don't think that aspect of uh, Islam has been robustly explored. The prison services are doing their best uh, under the circumstances. We have the issue of prison imams as well, whether they are up to scratch or not. Right. Matthew Wilkinson is currently researching de-radicalisation. A leading expert in his field, he often sits in on sessions in prisons. Not nearly as enough is known about the effects of the practice of Islam in prison generally. You know, both the benign and the malign. Not nearly enough is known about the effects of chaplaincy, when it works, when it doesn't, the conditions when it does work, the conditions when it doesn't. Not nearly enough is known about how to address prisoner resistance to good chaplaincy, you know, when people really don't want to change their mind and their behaviours. And considering we don't know exactly what works and what doesn't, are we taking a risk by just accepting that some, some people are being de-radicalised? Well, um, in my opinion, we are still in the phase of an absence of a really clear and well-designed method of assessing where people are at, especially uh, with religious ideology. So, you know, I, I do think we're still at a phase where we do run the risk of letting people who are still radicalised um, out of prison. Matthew Wilkinson does believe the system can work, but he also told me prisoners on de-radicalisation programmes can get as little as one hour's contact a week. Some have questioned whether that's enough, especially when there are pockets within our prisons that have major problems with radicalisation. Newsnight has been made aware of one prison that we've decided not to name. Two sources who work in the prison system have told us that they have particular concerns about one wing in that prison. And one inmate from that wing told us that when Khan's attack was announced, he heard Allah Akbar ringing out across the prison. We know that there are radicalised prisoners, but how to tell them apart from the genuinely de-radicalised? I'm quite wary of the fact that people can fake uh, compliance and some do slip through the net, some will be determined, and that's why I think it's absolutely important that we do not uh, ignore the strength of uh, Islamism. Our understanding of de-radicalisation programmes and how well they work is still developing. They seem to be effective in some cases and clearly not in others. The alternative, though, is to turn our backs on rehabilitation, something that both victims believed in passionately. James Clayton with that report. Joining us now, Charles Faulkner, Labour's former Lord Chancellor, and joining us from Southampton, Tobias Elwood, former Conservative Defence Minister who experienced firsthand the scene of a London terror attack where he gave um, first aid. Um, 
John, I'm going to start with you. Do, do you think it is ever possible to know if you have de-radicalised somebody? I'm sure it's not possible to know with certainty, but in some cases de-radicalisation will be successful. We should certainly not stop having de-radicalisation programmes, but the Usman Khan case does raise incredible questions about how successful our de-radicalisation programmes are, and separately from that, how good the intelligence within prisons is about whether or not somebody has been successfully de-radicalised, because that depends to a very large extent on effective, experienced prison officers being able to make judgments, because right. this is the case of Usman Khan is a series of judgments that turned out to be wrong. And it's making the right judgment about people that is so important. So when questions are raised, we both know policies tend to be rearranged yeah. or things kick in. Yeah. We know that 74 people um, have been released on licence. Yeah. What should happen? To them now? What will happen to them now? What would you suggest? I think what the Ministry of Justice are doing is the right thing, which is examining whether or not their licence conditions are being complied with. The Usman Khan case makes us incredibly vigilant to see whether or not there are signs with these 74 that there may be problems. One, for example, of the 74, he had a mobile phone additional to the one that he was allowed to have. That gives rise to the possibility that he is making communication with people that he shouldn't be doing. So we need to look at this very, very carefully. But it's the, the premise of this whole discussion is you can never be certain. Right. But that does not mean you shouldn't do it. They should be better than they are, the de-radicalisation programmes. We cannot have a situation where there are two to three hundred people in prison for terrorist offences who we are not going to consider for release because <coughs> that will be a that will make the position overall in the long term worse. The Times uh, tomorrow um, is saying that 200 extremists now face curbs and crackdowns. So that's another 200 who will probably find themselves what under more severe license or even in well, prison as a result of this? I'm not sure whether these 200 are ones who are not in prison or haven't been convicted, but if they are 200 who are not the subject of a conviction, what they mean is something called a tip him order, which will mean that they'll be subject to restrictions about where they live, where they can visit and who they can see. Um, Tobias, Charlie made the point that it all comes down to judgment, and when we look at all the people that have been in charge of the prison systems, whether it's the prisons ministers, whether it's justice ministers, we see how many have left. There have been five justice secretaries in the last ten years, Gove, Truss, Liddington, Gort, Buckland, three prison ministers, Roy Stewart, Robert Buckland, Lucy Fraser. Many of these people have now left your party altogether, if not politics altogether, is that where the crux of, of this problem lies? There isn't the judgment anymore, there isn't the expertise there. I don't agree with that uh, at all. Uh, the party, the government uh, creates policy, but as Lord Faulkner implied, and indeed it was in your opening piece, these are operational judgments taken by people on the front line who are experts in their field, but it is a developing field. We're having to come to terms with a judicial system that was never created to deal with people that want to take their life, that have a false interpretation of the Quran, that are willing to kill, believing that they're going to get a fast track to paradise. And we're having to learn very fast, not just in this country, but in other countries around the world. So and yes, we must all put our hands up and say mistakes were made here by the prison service, by the probation, by the court of appeal, by judges as well. And look very carefully and learn from this to make sure that we keep Britain safe. When, but when you I don't think it's wise to proportion blame just because there is ministerial churn. That happens in every department. More to do it is the strategy that's in place. Well, and if I must just say that the channel and the prevent strategies are actually uh, uh, copied uh, across the world in other parts in our counter dash efforts. You, and that's so it, important to recognise that can. it's working well but not good enough and we have to advance it. When you look at terrorism-related activity and the number of people in prison for it, that's risen 74% from 2010 to 2019. Does that tell you that the Conservative government has got it right? Are you happy to see that rise of 74%? Or does it suggest that that is too many? 
it, it clearly it is too many, but you've got to ask yourself, why are people being radicalized in the first place? Why are we getting people who are inspired by extremism, of taking this message, whether it be online or so forth? That is where we also have to look. It is people who are vulnerable. It's perhaps in the prison population as well. Um, Ian Aitson made a report to say that the, uh, they should not be put in the general uh, prisons population. That is a recommendation which I think Lord Carlyle, uh, if the Conservatives win the next election, will be taking forward. We absolutely have to learn from this, but we also recognise that there is yeah. a series of stakeholders here that each must look at their own and, part of their jigsaw to improve. I, I don't think that has been followed up with um, by the government entirely. But I, the, the question of, of how to treat terrorism and how to mm. treat I ideology, mm. do you do you think of it as a separate crime? Do you look at the philosophy or the creed behind it, or do you just say? This is criminality, it is criminality in gangs, and you treat it like you would any other crime. Well, the, the horror of the crime has to be judged as a crime. But the questions that you're raising about how you then treat it have to be dealt with within the prison system. Should you have a separate system for terrorism where you never let the terrorists out because of the risk they pose, because of all the questions you ask? I am sure that is absolutely the wrong answer. I'm also very doubtful about the H's and recommendations to which you're referring, that they should be separated from everybody else, because the, you then end up with a military style. Prison. Exactly, where the prisoners themselves, as it were, have hierarchies in which de-radicalisation becomes very difficult. Does it help to, to understand the philosophy? I it, mean, Of course it helps to understand the philosophy, and it's very important that the prison service engage imams who will be engaged with the prison authorities in seeking to de-radicalise. How successful it will be, particularly in a period where the prisons are stretched for other reasons, and if you take that out into the community after somebody is released, maybe after an assessment, you end up with stretched police, stretched probation, all of them who are making the decisions about, for example, could Mr Usman Khan come to London? Those were decisions made under great pressure. And, and by pressure, you're also referring to, to cuts on one level. We know that some of the worst cuts were to the, the justice system, 40%. We know that 62% of prisons are overcrowded. Do these now look like mistakes of the past decade, Tobias? Well, clearly, the environment that we've had to face in dealing not just in the Justice Department, right across the board, uh, in meeting the financial pressures that we inherited in 2010. But these why, why are. Why can't you just take responsibility for the last decade instead of looking back to the decade before? I'm not going to duck them. Absolutely. Uh, if, if there's more money, there's more funds available, more resources, they can all help. And clearly what has happened, the tragedy on uh, London Bridge uh, will focus minds. And uh, uh, the review has been put forward. The Prime Minister has made it clear that more money uh, will be available. But I make it absolutely clear there's not one single answer here. These are very difficult mm. judgments to make. Even if you keep somebody in prison, let's say for 30 to 40 years, you still have to make a judgment on when that person released, is, is it safe to bring them back into the general population? And that is an operational judgment to be made, not by a minister, but by the front line. And we need to make sure I mean, we I, get it right. I do strongly agree with what Tobias is saying, but these are amongst the most difficult decisions for the justice system. And the uh, the, the effect of the cuts has meant that in this very difficult area, it's been done where there's huge pressures from elsewhere. And we are developing knowledge over a decade or more because the problems given rise to, to, by Islamic terrorism is different mm. from that in relation to Irish terrorism, for example, where essentially, if you went to the Northern Irish jails, you saw in effect the terrorists in many places had taken over significant parts of the jail and we don't want to end up in that situation with the Islamic terrorists. But before we end I want to ask you both about uh, an issue that looks as if um, it will be addressed by uh, any future Conservative government which is the broader acts of the Constitution and this is in the Conservative Manifesto page 49. I don't know if we can just um, pull this up now and show you uh, what it says. We will ensure that judicial review is available to protect the rights of the individuals against an overbearing state while ensuring that it is not abused to conduct politics by another means or to create needless 
delays. Uh, this, this sounds as if, after Brexit says, we need to look at the broader aspects of our constitution, the relationship between the government, parliament and the courts. Is this a, a shifting away from a legal framework to a political framework? It is, and uh, I've read that, and I'd spotted it sometime before you ask. It's, it's an absolute echo of what the government's response was to the prorogation case, where the Supreme Court said the Prime Minister had acted unlawfully in proroguing for a long period of time. They said it was conducting politics by another means. So I read that bit of the manifesto as meaning there's not going to be any more prorogation cases. So if Mr Johnson becomes Prime Minister again, he won't be restrained by the courts from acting unlawfully. Tobias, your reflection on that? Um, well, I think you, there's something to be put for the Justice uh, Secretary. I can't see the quote in, in front of me, um, but I would uh, well, be it's, hesitant. It's about, let me I'd read it to you. It's well, from I'd the manifesto. I, I, I'd be hesitant to, uh, to go down the route again. We saw what happened with the Supreme Court. Uh, it, its verdict was very, very clear indeed. I think it's a distraction from what we need to focus on now. I just wanted to go back, if I may, just can, to can the international part of this. Can I just ask you, just to clarify that, before do, you go, do you think it is an abuse to try and rewrite the Constitution along those lines or do you think it is a necessary thing that your party wants to do? I think the, the interpretation of what you're reading there is something that you'd have to put uh, to the Justice Secretary. Uh, I can't comment on the details on that. I didn't write that part of any part of the manifesto. But if I can just add, we have the NATO summit this week and it was touched on by yourself and also, also by Lord Faulkner. There is an international element to the terrorism challenge that we face. This isn't just a British yeah. thing. It's focused this week on London Bridge. But we need to be united with our Western partners and working with our allies in the Muslim communities and in, in, in the Muslim world as well. Thank you To recognise that there needs to be a moderate message that goes through so we can tackle this uh, in the future. Thank you both.